So this is the title that I was assigned, and uh, this is what we will talk about for a few minutes. And I, this is the outline of what I will cover um, during this time. And, and I, I, when I planned this on the plane yesterday, I cut it down to about 20 minutes worth. And then I looked at the program and said, I've got 45 minutes. What am I going to say with a 20-minute talk in 45 minutes? So I spent some time early this morning putting, adding, adding more slides. And since we're now a little shorter, I will jump by a few things a, a little more rapidly than I might have planned to. So this will go at different paces depending on where we are in the, in the presentation. Uh, what I introduced this morning and where I thought there was a little extra time was a historical perspective, a very brief one. Uh, many people think that the obesity epidemic began 40 years ago or 30 years ago, 1980, and I wanted to dispel that idea in the first few slides. This is uh, a, a picture from the Nature article by Conrad in, 19, in 2008 uh, of the Venus of Holy Fells a statue that was found in uh, his, his uh, archaeological work in southern Germany uh, that is uh, about 35,000 years old. And, and the, it's clear that obesity is, it has been depicted in artifacts that far back. Uh, if not further, we haven't found any older ones, but I, I think it's possible there are some. The best known of these artifacts is another 10,000 years later. So I've jumped from 35,000 years ago to a little more than 20,000 years. This is the Venus of Willendorf, probably the most famous uh, that a statuette found in southern Germany, again, about uh, a century before the Venus of Holy Fell. So there clearly are, I suspect, more of these from various ages. But in the Paleolithic period, these are two examples of women who would be depicted as obese. Interestingly, on the previous one, you can see the genitalia are also very distinct and evident on this statue. There is no head. Uh, the author said in careful examination, it's clear the head wasn't lost. It just was never carved. So this is the, the torso of, of this individual. So I want to jump from the uh, old Stone Age uh, to the, uh, this is going to go forward, jumps. It's doing a bad thing with jumping around. I'll see if this works better. This projector is not exactly there. That's the one I want. Uh, jump uh, uh, something like uh, 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 10,000 more years to the beginning of the agricultural period. And when agriculture came in about 10,000 years ago, it dramatically changed the food supply for human beings. The first two figures uh, developed obesity, if, if that was the model which was used to make those statues. And I think that's a reasonable assumption. On, on the Paleolithic diet, which is what you could catch, catch or pick. You had to kill animals and eat the diet, which is a very relatively high protein, estimated to be 25 to maybe 30 percent of calories. It was a moderately high fat diet of, of similar amounts, with carbohydrates being variable depending on what time of year it was and where uh, you were. With agriculture, this dramatically changed, and our food supply now is about 75% from foods that were not available in the Paleolithic era. And yet in two parts of the world, there are uh, evidence of obesity on more than one kind of diet in over a, uh, tens of thousands of years. So it's obviously a, an issue which has a genetic base which can develop in some people uh, under any diet. Uh, and most of the depictions, as you will see, are, are of women. This is one from Turkey. Um, in the sixth millennium, which is 6,000 years ago. So we've made another big, big jump. Uh, and the final one I wanted to show you, which is not that one, uh, we're skipping slides for some reason in this, with this system. There is one from the Mayans. That's it. Uh, there is one Mayan figure from the classic period of, of the Mayan Stone Age, because they were Stone Age people, uh, depicting what I think all of us would agree it was a centrally obese uh, man, and that's unusual. Almost all the other depictions are of, of females. This is of a male uh, from about uh, 1,000 uh, years ago. So obesity has been 
with us for a long period of time. It is not a new phenomenon. And, and I wanted to talk about Hippocrates because we're now down to 2,500 years ago. And, and not only was obesity present in Hippocrates' time, but Hippocrates treated patients and described how he did it. If this wants to move forward one slide, let's see if that does it. Yes. Hippocrates' approach to treating obesity is described here. Uh, obese people and those desiring to lose weight should perform hard work before food. Well, that's not bad advice. Meals should be taken after exertion and while still panting from fatigue and with no other refreshment before meals except only wine. I like that suggestion of his. Uh, diluted and slightly cold. So for, for 2,500 years, and in all other medical traditions, which I'm not going to illustrate, obesity has been present, uh, and the physicians of that time have used mostly diet and exercise because that's what there was to treat uh, the problem. So it's not new. Uh, it's had treatments that have been going for a long time. I'm going to jump another 2,000 years. Uh, now we're, we're almost into modern times. We're up to 1,600. This is Professor Santor. Oh, boy, boy, this thing's really bad. Professor Santorio, if I get his right picture, there he is, uh, spent most of his professorial career at the University of Padua sitting on this scale, weighing the food he ate, the excreta he had, and he identified insensible perspiration. And his view of treating obesity or, and other diseases was that you had to modulate insensible perspiration, that if you had too much or too little, uh, you needed to have other ways of, of handling what, was, what we would call fluid balance with cathartics, with bleeding, and with uh, uh, things that were in medical practice up to the beginning of the 19th century. He was a very clever man. Uh, he was at Padua at the same time that Galileo was. And these are two of his instruments. One's a, a, a thermometer, uh, which he on the right, and another is a, a bed for weighing people up in a scale. So he was a very clever fellow and used the techniques of his time uh, uh, to uh, great advantage. But I would begin our modern period with William Wadd, an uh, interesting man. He's a surgeon. He was a secretary to the Royal College of Surgeons in London, and this is actually the picture that used to hang there. They've now archived it. It's hidden away somewhere in their, uh, in their files. But he, he, was, he wrote the first very nice, not the first, one of the first very nice monographs about obesity. He was born just at the time of our revolution. Um, he was apprenticed to uh, Sir James Earle at Barth St. Bartholomew's Hospital, Bart's, uh, uh, that one of the famous London hospitals. Uh, in 1801, he became a member of the College of Surgeons. Uh, and in 1824, he became a counselor. Uh, and in 1829, a member of their Court of Examiners. And that's also the year in which he died because his coach r ran away and he jumped out and was killed in the, in the process. But in 1810, uh, uh, 13 and 16, he wrote a little book about treatment of obesity, and he had some cases in it. He was a very good draftsman, uh, and this is one of the patients that he depicted in his little monograph. It's a lovely little, little book, and the one published in 1839 uh, on comments on corpulency. So I, I, I tend to date our modern obesity issue to this book which was written uh, and describing how common obesity was in England in the, in the early 19th century. Well, we think it's very common now, but remember, if you will, that it's been common in the practice of medicine's views for at least 200 uh, years. So it is not a new problem, but it is still one we have not solved. Diets are likewise not new. Atkins did not come up with the first diet. Uh, Banting actually probably deserves that credit, a diet very similar to what Atkins had. Um, he was an undertaker uh, who knew he needed to do something when he found he had to go down the stairs backwards because he couldn't walk down and he had to have people help him tie his shoes. He was 200 pounds and uh, about 63 years of age when he went on a diet recommended to him by his uh, ear, nose, and throat specialist, and I didn't know they treated obesity, but apparently in the early 19th century, mid-19th century, that was the case. And he lost 50 pounds in, he, in his little book, which he, it was, he published on his own expense for the first run because he was so excited about his results. He lost 50 pounds. There's a wonderful graph of his weight loss in this little monograph. Well, this was the first 
book. It was translated into many languages, widely distributed. Uh, it's a very readable little booklet. Uh, but he was badly abused by the press, this charlatan. Uh, how can a layman have anything important to say about medicine? But nonetheless, he, the term banting and bantingism appeared as a, as a synonym for weight and weight loss programs in the latter part of the 19th century. There were a number of other diets that I've shown here, uh, all of which are prior to the Great Depression. So dieting and diet books are, are common. They have been with us for at least 150 uh, years.